welcome to the West Texas Wrestling Show with your host Rick Elsie and Michael Shelton. Welcome everyone to the West Texas Wrestling Radio Show. I'm your host, Rick Elzey, here on Heck Yeah Radio. And I wanted to go ahead and let you know that Michael Shelton is on vacation this week, so I have with me a special guest co-host for the evening, the host of Saturday Night Requests Live, NL. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, uh, definitely been a wrestling fan uh, a long time. Been a while since I've listened, or have watched wrestling, but excited. Well, I'm glad to have you here. I had a lot of fun uh, a couple weeks ago on the Saturday Night Request Live with you, and so we're going to go ahead and return the favor by having you come here and talk some wrestling. I'm excited. Now, I did want to let my listeners know that, uh, just programming note, uh, we were to have an interview with West Texas wrestling star uh, Shane Garrett of the Top of Texas, uh, NWA Top of Texas. That will actually take place two weeks from tonight, and in place of that this evening, uh, we're going to have a little wrestling banter back and forth with NL here in a little bit. But before we do that, let's go ahead and get into our hot topics. Hot Topics is brought to you by PWInsider.com. All credit to Mike Johnson for the bits of reporting here. A couple weeks ago, we talked about Billy Corgan of the Smashing Pumpkins trying to purchase the National Wrestling Alliance from Bruce Tharp, the current owner. And we there was a little bit of issues with trademarks. Uh, we weren't sure exactly how that was going to proceed or whether or not that was going to proceed. But the news this week is that the trademark issues that had been preventing Billy Corgan from purchasing the National Wrestling Alliance appear to have been resolved, paving the way for the former TNA wrestling president to purchase the NWA brand. All interest of the trademarks related to the National Wrestling Alliance, three in the United States and one in Japan, were assigned to Bruce Tharp's International Wrestling Corp over to Lightning One Incorporated as of 525. That is actually a group that lists Billy Corgan as their director, so they are now the owners of all NWA trademarks. Also... James Raymond, 35, the point person involved in a Wrestling for Autism fundraiser held last April in Connecticut by Paradise Alley Pro Wrestling, a wrestling school and promotion run by former WWF and WCW star Paul Roma and former WWF enhancement talent Mario Mancini, was arrested by East Haven, Connecticut police this week and charged with issuing a bad check. As previously noted on PWInsider.com, the check Raymond wrote to the promotion was reimbursed for their expenses and bounced. The promotion later learned that the $5,000 they raised for the event as well, which was to be donated to Autism Services and Resources in Connecticut, was never actually donated. The event had drawn 600 fans, and the scam had captured the attention of local news uh, in the area. Local media reports indicate that the police did gain a warrant to arrest Raymond after it became obvious that he had no intention of cooperating with their investigation into the issue. So that's awful. Uh, I hate it when, as I, even as a promoter myself, when uh, people use wrestling for uh, charity events and then don't follow through. That's pretty terrible. Uh, that's, uh, I was sitting here listening to that going, wow. You'd be amazed that it happens uh, much more often than you think. Uh, also in news, uh, Cody Rhodes won the Ring of Honor Championship last weekend over former champion Christopher Daniels at Ring of Honor's Best in the World pay-per-view. Interesting little tidbit with that, uh, WWE's Daniel Bryan uh, commented uh, on the win on Twitter uh, by actually congratulating uh, Cody and then basically issuing a challenge to him 462 days in the future to go ahead and face him for the belt, which a lot of people are speculating is the end of Daniel Bryan's WWE contract, which has led to a lot of speculation that he's essentially planning to wrestle once he leaves the promotion. Uh, WWE had actually sidelined him and forced retirement uh, two years ago because of a lot of issues with his head. And then, of course, uh, also we have uh, Asuka, the in NXT Women's Champion. Uh, she actually created a major milestone this past weekend when she surpassed the Honky Tonk Man 
as the longest reigning uh, WWF champion uh, in history at this moment. Uh, and that's a pretty, pretty big deal. Yeah, it sounds like it anyway. Right now it's time for our West Texas indie scene. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about this coming Saturday night uh, on July 1st. NWA Top of Texas from the WrestlePlex in Amarillo, Texas will present a night of wrestling. Uh, tickets are going to be $10 for adults, $5 for kids. Military will be free with ID. They do have a BYOB option uh, for an additional $3 with adult ID. Also on July 1st, CWF Lubbock from Highland Baptist Church, 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., NWA champion Tim Storm, Adam Asher, Ryan Hart, Buzzard, Shiloh, Ricky Graves, Seven, and Sergeant Brent Cross at a wrestling event with admission details available at www.cwflubbock.com. Upcoming July events, OSW, Old School Wrestling out of Odessa, Saturday night, July 8th at 7 p.m., an evening with Brent Hart. It's a Q&A, and they're having that at the MCM Elegante in Odessa, Texas. Tickets are $75 for VIP passes, $50 for premium seating, $25 for general admission. And then on Saturday evening, July 15th, Rampage Wrestling, 7.30 p.m. bell time, American Spirit uh, at, the Premier, at the Premier Sports Plex in Lubbock, Texas. Tickets are $10 for adults, $5 kids at 12 and under the rampager experience is an additional five bucks you get early entry bonus matches meet and greets uh and this show does feature former wwe and roh superstars the spirit squad and then on saturday night july 22nd squared circle pro 7 p.m the 2017 human chess tournament from jake's back room in lubbock texas tickets are ten dollars all ages there is limited seating and most tickets are standing room only featuring a 21-man tournament plus a fatal four-way for the SCP Championship. And that's kind of what's going on coming up in the month of July. Now, I had a question. You said Bret Hart. Is that the Bret Hart I know? That yes, I'm that, the hitman, Bret Hart. They're <laughs> going to be having a Q&A with him uh, in Odessa at, at the Elegante. Uh, and essentially what it is is he sits on a stage, uh, he tells some stories, he opens the floor up for fans, and they get to basically ask him questions. Oh, wow. Uh, it's just like an evening with Bret Hart. It, it's pretty cool, actually. Uh, it sounds cool. It, it's really, really fun. Um, they, he's not the only one that does it. Uh, Jim Ross does it. Jim Cornette does it. A lot of wrestlers will do it. Now it's time for this day in history, and that would be June 30th. In 1944, former NWA and ECW world champion and one of the greatest performers of all time, Amarillo's own Terry Funk, was born. And also on this day in 1960, the sports arena in Amarillo, Texas, ran a card that was headlined by Mike DiBiase and Ed Sharp defeating Bob Geigel and Nick Roberts in three falls. And then on this day in 1977 at the Sports Arena in Rural, Texas, there was a card headlined by Cyclone Negro defeating Big Bad John, and Dick Murdoch fought Abdullah the Butcher to a double countout. On this day in 1985, Cody Rhodes was born. And also on this day... A very great angle took place on Monday Night Raw. I just want to kind of walk through this because this was actually really cool. And we always like to talk about a really good angle that took place on this day in history. Uh, essentially what happened was it was the night after a major pay-per-view. Uh, the champion at the time was Edge. He was the world champion. And everybody had been chasing him, including Batista. Uh, and nobody could really beat the guy. And then uh, during this segment... Edge basically said he was leaving the show. He was going to go over to SmackDown. Nobody was going to be able to beat him for the championship. And Batista came down, and they argued. He Batista beat Edge within an inch of his life uh, as, as a going-away gift. And then out of nowhere, 
CM Punk, who was a very young, upcoming star at the time, uh, hadn't really done much in WWE, but was a big fan of uh, internet wrestling fans. and uh, they, they loved him. Uh, he was a big fan favorite on the indie scene. He had recently won the Money in the Bank contract, and he came down and took advantage of Edge uh, being beat up in the ring and actually won the World Championship live on Monday Night Raw. It was a really hot angle. Crowd went bananas. Uh, it was just a really good time. Oh, it sounds like it was a good time. You know, I remember that. Uh, you were sitting there describing that, and I went, huh, I know it's been a while, but I remember that show. <laughs> I remember when that went down because I, I was kind of a Batista fan back then. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, you know, and Batista has actually been in and out of WWE quite a bit uh, over the last, uh, you know, 10 years or so. And now that he's a a very big star in the Marvel Universe, uh, being Drax in the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, uh, they will use him anytime he is available because (laughs) with him comes some big name notoriety now. And, uh, of course, you know, he's not going to show up now unless he gets a monster payday. (laughs) Right, right. But I remember that Edge deal doing that in, uh, in him threatening. Or did he did he end up going to SmackDown? I, I think he did end up going to SmackDown after it was all said and done. But he didn't leave with the championship because CM Punk won it that night. Right, right. All right. Now, at this time, this is where we would normally have an interview with a wrestling personality. But since I do have NL here, uh, I did come up with a topic that we could talk about. Uh, Essentially, I wanted to talk about kind of just, you know, cable wrestling uh, childhood memories. Uh, I know that myself, uh, I've been a wrestling fan since I was five years old. Oh, wow. And uh, my first memories of watching wrestling on television uh, were with, uh, we used to have a a KTVT uh, Dallas station here uh, that had world class on it. Uh, We also, of course, TBS uh, broadcast Jim Crockett sports, which was mid Atlantic or the NWA at the time. Uh, It eventually became WCW. ESPN was pretty, pretty new. And at the time, and they, they had a lot of AWA, Um, but those were my early, television influences uh i just want to know uh, you know when how, how young how far back do you remember watching wrestling and what was it that you were watching well i wasn't very young unfortunately back whenever i was a kid it was all about the cowboys at that time in my household and uh wasn't a lot of wrestling but uh, when i got a little older probably probably late teens actually uh, a buddy of mine was big into it and i watched the first pay-per-view over at his house and it happened to be wrestlemania and i think it was in 90 90- two or three i watched wrestlemania and that was my very first experience of anything wrestling well the 92 wrestlemania uh, if i remember correctly that was uh wrestlemania 8 that would have been the hoosier dome uh that would have been um rick flair randy savage uh hulk hogan sid justice yes, those were the yeah. big matches uh the one in 93 would have been wrestlemania 9 the big match on that show it was, was 92 it was 92. 92 okay so yeah 92 that was that was a actually a, a transitional year for wrestling as uh that was a year that uh Hogan was about to take a major break. Uh, WWF at the time, now WWE, was starting to move to uh, smaller wrestlers. Uh, Bret Hart was starting uh, his singles runs. Uh, Shawn Michaels, uh, many of the others that uh, were kind of the smaller wrestlers, not you know not the big beefy giants like Hogan. Uh, you know they were kind of becoming the flavor of the day. Uh, so that was actually '92 was a pretty big transitional year in the business. Well, the thing about that is I watched that, and we watched. I watched a little bit more wrestling with him. I wasn't really into it, but when I really got into it was probably close to 20. I was. It was right when Stone Cold, The Rock, those guys kind of came on the scene, and I instantly fell in love with Stone Cold. Yeah, that would have been uh, yeah the Monday Night War period. That that's pretty much most of the guys that are actually wrestling today uh, on the indie scene. Uh, they they all became fans during the Monday Night War. Yeah, so I, I uh, think that, it was easy to be a Stone Cold and Rock fan. So I mean, yeah. I, I was it was easy for me. And I guess I really like Stone Cold more than the Rock. I like Rock's flair and his style, and he could definitely work the mic. But Stone Cold just appealed to me. The interesting thing about the Stone Cold and Rock characters, from my perspective, is that uh, their their popularity really reflected 
the uh, change in culture at the time that they were popular because uh, neither one of those characters were really uh, squeaky clean baby faces. Uh, they were mostly, uh, you know, trash talking heels that the fans just happened to like. Uh, because if you took the rock and stone cold characters of the late 90s and put them up against the, the Hogan type characters of the mid 80s, uh, they, they just looked downright bad, like bad guys. <laughs> I mean, I, and I think probably Stone Cold was probably a little more of the rebellious uh, heel type guy. But and you're right. I mean, people just I did. I mean, I never looked at him as a heel, but he was really kind of was. I think that everybody really secretly dreams of beating up their boss. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's yeah. why that appealed to people. Right, honestly. right. And he definitely did that in time or two. So that that was always fun to watch. Well, I tell you, you know, being a, a kid. And, and being into wrestling uh, from a very early age, I was very fortunate to be able to come into wrestling at a time when the 80s boom was really taking shape. Uh, and luckily, uh, I had the capability to watch uh, quite a few regional promotions uh, because our cable systems here in Amarillo at the time were carrying channels like uh, the Financial News Network, which, interestingly enough, carried Continental Championship Wrestling out of Alabama. I have no idea why, but it did. Um, we also had, you know, wrestling on a Fox station here. Uh, we also had uh, con uh, access to WOR out of New Jersey, which carried a lot of WWF. Uh, USA Network carried Southeastern Championship Wrestling. Uh, so we really had uh, the run of the mill as far as all kinds of regional wrestling, uh, national wrestling. Uh, I just really grew up in a time where I got to watch uh, people wrestle all over the country. And then when they eventually all filtered up to the major leagues uh, in WWF and the NWA, I already was familiar with the characters. And so uh, I was invested in them emotionally. And I think that it helped really build an emotional tether to the business for me. Yeah, I could definitely see that happening. And, 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 you know, just sitting here, obviously I've listened to the show the last three weeks, and, and it's great to be here today be, to kind of really get engaged in this because the more, the more I've done this and the more I think about my history in wrestling and where I grew up in the, in, in with the business or grew up liking wrestling, like I said, it really started for me at a late age. But it sounds like at, at, at your time that it was all over the TVs and it was very accessible where it seemed like me whenever I was a kid, it wasn't as accessible. Well, you know, and by the time you actually uh, got into watching it, uh, as you were saying earlier, uh, by that time, so many of the regional promotions had closed up shop. Uh, I mean, when Vince McMahon expanded nationally in the mid 80s, uh, he systematically, piece by piece, went from territory to territory to territory, bought up the local news stations, paid for his own syndicated uh, cable you know, rights and would take the couple of main stars from the area and those areas would dry up. Um, I mean, when I was first broke in, you know, there was the AWA and the UWF and WWF and Championship Wrestling from Florida and Memphis and Mid-Atlantic and World Class. And by the time, you know, the Monday Night Wars came around, there was only WWF, WCW and ECW and everybody else was gone. Yeah, I mean, that's really the the ones I remember are the WWF, uh, the WCW, which really, I, I guess I was always kind of a, a Hogan fan when I first, because watching that WrestleMania was my first entrance into wrestling. I kind of latched onto him until, you know, the Stone Colds and the Rocks came along. But uh, when he went to WCW, I followed. Yes, and, and so many, so many fans did. Uh, you know, it was a it was a shrewd move at the time uh, for WCW to grab a hold of the names that uh, Vince McMahon had eventually, or essentially, built his entire promotion around uh, for the previous ten years. Because WCW, you know, they they snapped up Hogan, they snapped up Randy Savage, they got the Honky Tonk Man, they got Hacksaw Jim Duggan. I mean, they brought in all of these guys that uh, were the cornerstones of Vince McMahon's business for the previous ten years, and they you know, market them to a whole brand new group of stars uh, and, and brand new group of fans. And yeah, it, it, it actually forced Vince McMahon to change the way he did business because then instead of just presenting the same old show, Vince had to actually take a chance and start putting on a more adult product, a little less ch uh, kid driven. And then there's where your stars like Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock come in because those are not really uh, kiddie characters. Well, and I'm going to assume it's like with anything, whenever you're an event or a sporting event or something like that makes a major change like that, you know, the old timers, the, the original fans or the original people that were watching that, 
they don't like change. So I think that probably took some of those people too because of what Vince was doing with the, with the product at the time. And of course, WCW seemed to, and whenever I went to watching WCW, it seemed to continue the product that he had built. That's very true. Uh, a lot of uh, fans uh, that were fans of strictly the WWF at the time, uh, of course now WWE, uh, they, they didn't watch the WCW product because – it felt like to them it was a little bit uh, WWF light. Uh, and so, you know, they would just hang out on their own channel. But um, what WCW really did during that time period was they used the popularity of those stars to hook older fans. And then in the process, they started introducing new concepts bringing in characters like the cruiserweights from all over the world, uh, smaller wrestlers that could have more uh, exciting, fast-paced matches. Uh, and they, you know, went live every week instead of taping their product. Uh, and, you know, they, they would do things that would hook new viewers, but they got it all was built on the fact that they brought in these recognizable, marketable brand names uh, to get people to watch to begin with. So it was actually a very shrewd move. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. And, you know, I, I you know, I talk, t- told you that it was one of my school or one of my uh, young friends that got me into it in that 92 WrestleMania. He stayed WWF at the time. And like I said, I kind of split. And, you know, it's what's funny about it is we became unfriends become of, because of it. So kind of crazy how that worked. <laughs> I mean, I don't know why anybody would unfriend you over that, but uh, he did. I mean, we, we became because he was so against the WCW and what the what was being done, he felt like it was a copycat. He felt like they stole a bunch of people. He just felt like it was just a big conspiracy. Well, and I I, I actually understand that more than you would think <laughs> because uh, I know that I had a lot of friends that we all watched wrestling, and uh, when when WCW and Nitro took off, uh, about half of us watched that, and half of us watched Raw, and uh, you know every once in a while we would uh, debate and argue, you know which was the better program, but uh, it definitely polarized the wrestling audience, uh, which was something that didn't happen during the '80s because when you had all the territory and you had all these different regional promotions all over, everyone was so incredibly different that you had your own group of fans, you know, all in each of these different areas, but you could watch it and appreciate it, everybody, because it was the, it was their own singular deal. Right. But when it was WCW versus WWF, it really became a cutthroat uh, battle to try and put the other company out of business, which completely goes against the entire purpose of what this is supposed to be, <laughs> yeah. which is just entertainment. Well, and you know, it's, you know, just from what I've seen in, in, in really my youngness in this, in watching wrestling, even though I've been watching as long as I have, Vince McMahon is a power guy to me. I mean, and I don't know if that's true or not, but he just seems like he wants control of everything to do wrestling. And I mean, he's done a pretty good job of that, but that's just, that's the persona I get from him. Oh, it's absolutely, that's absolutely true. Uh, and a perfect example of, of him being, you know, uh, all, all about power is that uh, when he finally had enough uh, money uh, built up that he could actually purchase uh, WCW, purchase his own competition, uh, about that time ECW went out of business as well and he purchased their uh, holdings out of bankruptcy court, what he had in his hands was he had three national promotions that had three separate fan bases and three separate rosters of wrestlers. And at that moment, should he have wanted to, he could have put on three different shows every week and had them compete against one another, and he would be the sole profiter. But he couldn't do it. He had to be the winner. And so he squashed both promotions, uh, did some quick, uh, uh, for about a year, he did some quick uh, angles and matches to uh, completely devalue the other promotions. And, you know, at the end, the who, who was it's WWF. the person that was in charge of WCW or, or the main man? I, I, Eric, the name, Eric Bischoff. That's it. That's it. And he brought him over after that transition, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, after the, after the invasion and after everything was shelved, he did bring Eric Bischoff in in uh, the summer of 2003. And... Uh, Act, well, it was, was it two thousand? I think it was two thousand. It was around there. It was two thousand. I was heavy watching. Um, yeah, it, it was the it was the summer of two thousand and two. They brought him in as the general manager yeah. for Raw, uh, which was very surreal and very strange. Um, 
But yes, he he did have that. Uh, and actually, around that time, uh, Paul Heyman, who was the head of ECW, was also working for the company. So yeah, essentially, yeah. Paul Heyman was the name I was actually yeah, thinking of. Essentially, all three of the top promoters in the country were working under the same banner at the same time, which yeah. was which could have been amazing had they just, you know let everybody do what they're what they do best but you, know, <laughs> you could see some dysfunction it. in that as it was going down to me i mean whenever he announced eric bischoff and, and i mean paul Heyman made some appearances and stuff during that transition time too didn't he yes he did uh matter of fact uh once eric bischoff came on board uh and paul Heyman was already in the fold uh they actually did a brand split where uh Heyman and Bischoff ended up being the general managers for the two separate shows Raw and SmackDown so it was a very interesting situation where uh the former heads of the double competition for Vince McMahon were now the general managers of his shows under his umbrella which was okay. very strange that's that's right that's right and you know I, I you know back then I did watch both programs religiously uh, raw and and uh, uh, smackdown and I remember that. I remember that's like I kept remembering the name Paul Heyman and, and wasn't he actually the de facto boss of WCW or of ECW, right? Yes, he, okay. he was the actual booker okay, that's promoter right, that's right. online boss of uh, ECW. Yes. See, I'm I'm kinda having to get a crash course in my memory here. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> but I mean this is bringing back memories. I what's funny about all this is uh, you know, of course Michael and I, your your normal co host, him and I go way back. We've known each other for a long time and I remember two things. One they used to show Raw at a local movie theater here on the big screen, and we would always religiously go watch Raw every Monday night. It was night. Gassy Jacks. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. So we would go there all the time, and I went with Michael several times. And then I had this little hangout in my old house that I had, and we used to watch the, the pay-per-views on the special boxes we had back then, and uh, I was religiously watching all that stuff. But uh, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, when you get tied up into the storyline and you really get into it, you want to watch each week and you want to get into it. And, I really don't, I guess, you know, to me, I, and I, this might be bad to say, but kind of what killed me and what drove, not really drove me away, but I lost interest is when Stone Cold left, The Rock left, and the product, I guess, went through another change, I, I guess would probably be the best word for it. And Cena kind of was coming onto the scene whenever I was at the tail end of my regular watching back then. And I liked Cena, but I was just kind of bummed out when The Rock and Stone Cold kind of kind of shelled up and they, and they weren't no, no more a part of it. Well, you know, and it, it did. It absolutely affected the business because uh, even though, you know, people romantically remember that, uh, you know, how, how awesome the Monday Night Wars were uh, because of characters like The Rock and Stone Cold and DX and uh, Mick Foley, uh, what they don't really realize was that because Vince changed the way he did business and he went to a more hard-hitting, violent adult product with these new stars, uh, he actually ended up... Uh, putting himself in a position where uh, guys got hurt, guys retired early, and then the Monday Night Wars were over. He had no more competition, so he decided to go ahead and just kind of go back, scale back uh, to what he was doing before, um, which is kind of putting on a, a more PG product because they are a publicly held company with stockholders. And since they changed their entire game and they had lost all their big stars from that era, yeah, it completely changed the business. And in the process, it ran a lot of people off. You know, uh, 20 years ago, they used to draw uh, 5.0s and 6.0 ratings on a Monday night. And now they're drawing 2.9. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So you're talking back in the, the Stone Cold Rock oh, era. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, and, you know, I through through these last three weeks, I have caught a few. And, I, you know, I haven't, I should have, but I haven't sat down and watched a whole program. But I have thought, I mean, and it seems interesting to me. I guess, you know, you have to get back into the storyline and, and kind of get caught up there and whatnot. Well, the best part of today's wrestling, in my opinion, is uh, that uh, one of the former wrestlers who is now actually uh, Vince McMahon's son-in-law, Triple H, yep. uh, he is in Was charge. One of my yeah, he is in charge of their developmental area, uh, which is called NXT. And NXT, it, it basically, it's the proving ground for the future stars of WWE. Uh, it's wildly popular. It has a, uh, their own show on the WWE Network. They have their own little pay-per-views called Takeovers. And these stars are being brought in much in the vein 
of the Attitude Era stars, which uh, are the Monday Night Wars stars, where they're, they're a little more uh, edgy. They have a little more character to them. And so, you know, the business is starting to change again, but it's slow going. Uh, it's going to take some time. Uh, but right now, I think that the shows are getting a little more exciting because the level of talent and characters is so much better than it was even 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I really kind of think that, too. I mean, uh, you know, if you don't evolve with change, you know, with anything, you know, my, my big gig and, and my big thing for a long time now is, is baseball. I'm a huge fan and have been for a long time. But, you know, even that game, as simple as it is and as old timey as it is, it's gone through a lot of evolutions. So, I mean, you're going to get that with any product you have out there. That's true, and, and and wrestling has undergone a gigantic revolution uh, and an evolution actually uh, over the last uh, forty years that I've been watching it. Uh, I can tell you that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the discussion. I do want you to hang around uh, because we are going to uh, get into a, a couple of segments here where we do kind of uh, have a little participation. Uh, but right now we're going to break for station identification and we'll be right back with our top 10. You are listening to Heck Yeah Radio. We'd like to remind everybody that uh, following this show, please stay tuned with us because you've got an evening with violent reaction. <laughs> All right, it's time for our weekly top 10. The subject of our top 10 this week is bloodiest wrestlers. And basically what we're going to do is we're just going to run down uh, my personal list of wrestlers that I feel like uh, you couldn't watch their matches without expecting it to be a bloodbath. Uh, now, there's not a lot of blood in today's wrestling, but uh, I can tell you that 30 years ago, uh, seeing blood was a pretty regular uh, occurrence. So I'll go through this list. Uh, some of these guys you may remember, NL. Um, first off, at number 10, Sabu. Sabu was a major star in ECW. He's the, actually the nephew of the original Sheik, who actually does make an appearance on our countdown as well. Um, yeah, I remember him. Yes. Uh, Sabu was kind of the innovator of breaking tables, uh, uh, using chairs wrapped in barbed wire. Uh, the, the guy's absolutely crazy. <laughs> It, uh, anybody that has, that does the blood thing, I think is crazy. <laughs> well, everybody on this list is crazy. <laughs> Number nine, Tommy Dreamer. Tommy Dreamer was also a major star of the ECW era. Uh, Tommy could not have one single match without having what we call the crimson mask. And that's where you actually bleed so bad that it cakes all over your face and it looks like a mask. <laughs> is that like a beauty thing? Uh, I don't know that it's a beauty thing, but it's definitely something that uh, is horribly frightening when you see it in person. <laughs> I just was wondering if you pull that thing off, if it cleans your pores. <laughs> well, I no, I actually think it probably clogs them. It's probably <laughs> yeah, terrible. Right. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> number eight, the American Dream Dusty Rhodes. Now, if you go look at any picture of Dusty Rhodes and look above his left eye, you will see a patch of scar tissue on his head where years and years and years of being busted open on the head. Uh, it's like he has to wear, he had to wear before he, of course he passed away a few years ago, but uh, for many years he had to wear Vaseline on his head to just make sure that uh, you, he didn't actually start bleeding because there were, the scar tissue was so bad. You could literally thump the guy in the head and he would just start bleeding. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess you would. Uh, <laughs> so you're talking Vaseline like the, the boxers would do or whatnot? Yes, very, okay, yes, okay. exactly. Number seven, Amarillo's own Terry Funk. Uh, T Terry Funk was a hardcore wrestler from way back in the day. Uh, and uh, Funk saw kind of a resurgence in his career uh, in the early 90s when he would do what's called death matches in Japan, uh, where they would wrestle in barbed wire. They would wrestle actually with uh, exploding rings. They would use light tubes. Um, it was pretty horrific. Uh, but, yeah, he, he would bleed all over the place in every match that he wrestled in. And number six, a guy that Funk would bleed a lot with, 
Mick Foley. Some people may remember him as Cactus <laughs> Jack or Mankind or Dude Love. Uh, also, Mick was one of the original purveyors of the quote unquote Crimson Mask. There are some great pictures of Mick uh, online that you can find from the Japanese death matches where he's literally just caked in his own blood. It's just horrific pictures, but uh, the matches are amazing. Well, I'd have to say that, that I was hoping he was going to be on this list because he's the one I remembered from back in the day. It's like every wrestling match, he got bloody and oh, or yes. did some crazy stuff or, oh, or yeah. something. And I always thought he was one of the best scrappers in the business. Oh, yeah. Well, Mick Foley was uh, easily one of the best brawlers, uh, one of the best characters, uh, best interview. Uh, but when, when he really, you know, wanted to put on a show, uh, that guy would just bleed all over the place. Yeah, I do remember. <laughs> Number five, the original Sheik. Uh, I, I, interestingly enough, my very first match that I ever watched uh, when I was in kindergarten uh, live, like or my first match live, I went with some friends uh, in my kindergarten class with their parents to the sports arena here in town to watch some wrestling. It was my first time. And the main event of that show was the original Sheik versus Andre the Giant. And they brawled all around the sports arena, covered in blood. It was it was all over the place. And I have to tell you, I was absolutely petrified. I, 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 I didn't. How old were you? I was six. Oh, yeah, I think I'd be petrified, too. <laughs> I was six. But um, I can tell you that uh, the next morning, you know, when we went to school, uh, it was all we could talk about. <laughs> and, and from that moment on, I had the sickness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could, <laughs> six years old. I, wow. Yeah, I could remember. I just would think about what you would be going through your mind seeing that live. No. And really not understanding what wrestling is. I no, mean, I don't know if no. you did or not, but I, I don't think I would have. No, I, all I knew was these two incredibly large men uh, were coming in my direction, and they were covered in blood, and they were carrying weapons, and, <laughs> and I didn't know what to do. <laughs> run? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get up and run. <laughs> Number four on the list, the Sheep Herders. Now, a lot of people may remember them as the Bushwhackers in the WWF. But before they went to the WWF as the Bushwhackers, they wrestled all over the world as the Sheep Herders. And the Sheep Herders, their, speciali their speciality were barbed wire cages. And those guys just were walking scar tissue. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was kind of interesting to see them be the Bushwhackers in the WWF because it was almost like a reward. Uh, that they didn't have to cut themselves up anymore. They didn't have to bleed all over the place because now they could just march around like morons and lick people's faces. I was going to say, that's what I remember of them. I don't remember much blood and stuff from them. <laughs> uh, I just, I do. And I, I, I don't guess I really cared for them, but I mean, I didn't hate them or anything. If anybody did not know who the sheep herders were before the bushwhackers, uh, I highly recommend going on to YouTube uh, and looking up a match uh, from the UWF in, I believe, 1986 or 87, uh, where the sheep herders fought the Fantastics in a barbed wire cage. It's available on YouTube. You can watch it. It's it's an amazing match and a complete demonstration in absolute brutality. It, it's pretty cool. It uh, it uh, sounds pretty cool. Number three on the list, Bruiser Brody. Now, Bruiser Brody unfortunately died in 1988 uh, before he could actually get a major run uh, with Vince McMahon's WWF. Uh, he actually died in Puerto Rico. But uh, Bruiser's matches were always wild brawls. He went all over the building. Uh, one of his opponents uh, that people seem to remember quite a bit was Abdullah the Butcher. Uh, they would bleed all over the place. Uh, Bruiser was definitely one tough hombre. Um but uh, actually being at number three is interesting because the number two person on our list is Abdullah the Butcher. Now, Abdullah was uh, the madman from the Sudan. This guy was uh, advertised as being banned in 17 states. He would hide a fork in his trunks that he would pull out and stab opponents in the head. Um, he actually had three large grooves carved into the top of his forehead where he could actually put a quarter in those grooves because and, and those were actually from years and years of being cut in the head uh it was so deep though he could put a quarter in those grooves oh well i guess if he needed to make a phone call he just reached for his head <laughs> 
at number one on our list, uh, Carlos Colon. And a lot of people may not actually remember Carlos Colon, uh, but uh, he was a major star in the Puerto Rico area for a World Wrestling Council. You can see a lot of his matches on YouTube. His son, Carlito, was a big star for WWF uh, in the... Uh, 2003, 2004, and 2005 era, uh, one of his sons and one of his nephews are currently wrestling for WWF right now as uh, the Colon brothers on the SmackDown brand. But uh, Carlos Colon was one of those guys. He was a local hero uh, on the island, and he was always part of major matches, especially violent matches, and he, he would just bleed buckets. Uh, he fought Abdul the Butcher quite a bit. He fought Bruiser Brody quite a bit. He had some good matches with Terry Funk. Um, but I highly recommend, if you're somebody that hasn't really watched uh, any wrestling in a while uh, look up some of these names that we've just gone over because they have amazing matches uh, and if you're somebody that really likes the blood aspect of it you will not be disappointed <laughs> definitely All right, it's time for our rotating segment of the week, uh, and we're going to do a segment here uh, with NL that uh, we haven't actually done before, and this segment that we're going to Should do, I be scared? <laughs> no. <laughs> the segment <laughs> is going to be called, uh, Who Booked This? And essentially what we do here is we p take a angle or an event from the past and we talk about, you know, uh, kind of what went wrong with it and what could have been better. And because uh, you were a pretty big fan during the uh, Monday Night Wars, the topic that I want to talk about is the NWO. Okay. Yeah, I'm very familiar with that. Now, a lot of fans complain that what happened with the NWO was that it was far too large as far as the number of members and it seemingly went on forever. Uh, I mean, I liked the NWO. I liked what it brought to the... In fact, whenever the NWO kind of started dissolving, I was kind of sad. So, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I could see where it was something different. And, you know, kind of like I would mentioned earlier in the show, when you make any kind of major changes, a lot of your long-term watchers or listeners or whatever will kind of go, what? So, I No, I that. completely understand that. Uh for those of you who may not know a lot about the NWO, just a little bit of background and what we're talking about. The NWO angle was kicked off when Scott Hall, formerly known as Razor Ramon, and Kevin Nash, formerly known as Diesel, jumped from the World Wrestling Federation over to WCW in the summer of 1996. And the angle was that they were invaders from an outside promotion that they would not name. But, of course, everybody knew where they were from. But they did not give them names on television. They didn't call them Scott Hall or Razor Ramon. They didn't call them Kevin Nash or Diesel. They just kept saying, you know who they are. And then they would talk about what they were currently doing in WCW. And what they were actually trying to do was they were trying to give the impression, WCW was, that WWF was invading their program. And, of yeah, course, I could see that. that turned into a huge court battle that uh, we can talk about it at another time. Mm -hmm. But uh, that also led to Hulk Hogan turning heel for the first time since 1982 and joining this group to form the New World Order. This was a complete departure from everything that Hulk Hogan had done since 1984. And there's no more Hulkamania, you know, no more little kids running wild. This was a, a very dark angle for him. Uh, he became Hollywood Hogan instead of Hulk Hogan. And he started to lead this stable of uh, party crashers. Uh, and over time, most of the guys that were getting involved in the stable were former WWF names. Uh, Ted DiBiase, the one, two, three kid who became six. Uh, Virgil, who, be who now became Vincent. Um, and characters like Big Bubba Rogers, who was the big boss man in WWF, uh, Michael Wall Street, who had been IRS in the WWF. Uh, it was just stacked full of former WWF guys. And it was quite an interesting angle because uh, WCW, the home promotion, was actually on the run 
and really could never get a good footing against these new invaders. And their main character, Sting, was actually ostracized by the WCW uh, wrestlers because they thought he was part of the NWO. And he ended up debuting the new Crow character that he, he, he kind of changed from being the surfer guy to the Crow guy. And this kicked off an entire year of storyline where the NWO just ran all over WCW and Sting would walk around in the rafters. He would never talk. He would never wrestle. Uh, but he would always rappel down from the ceiling and chase off the NWO at the end of the night. Yeah, he was kind of like trying to be the savior of the day, I guess. Really, He really was, yes. Yeah, I remember that. I, you know, and you talked about when uh, Hogan changed over to Hollywood and, and joined the NWO. I loved it. I ate that stuff up. So I was like, oh, yeah, here we go. It's NWO is going to kick off. It was a pretty big deal because, you know, it shocked everybody. It did. Um, it did. Nobody expected it to happen. Well, he was your quintessential good guy. He, he was. was the face of everything. He, he was the face of wrestling. Yes, he really was. Um, and, you know, this built and built and built until Starcade 1997, where Sting would fight Hogan. Uh, it was Sting's first match on, on any kind of television or pay-per-view in over a year. And it would have been the end of you know, of, of a major angle it, to, to have Sting win and save the day would have been the perfect capper to this amazing angle. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. Uh, he did beat Hogan, but it was very controversial. There was a controversial ref count. And within a couple of months later, uh, Hogan had beat him again. And it was almost like the entire year had never taken place. And the NWO was just as strong as they always were. Right, right. And, you know, WCW never really got their comeback. And so then they went through another year of the NWO, uh, but they started to slowly break apart into two different groups. And it became really about the two separate factions of the NWO feuding while WCW was hanging off off to the yeah, side yeah, saying, Hey, that. don't forget about us. Yeah. And it was, it was like, uh, it was almost like uh, the, the storyline was that WCW was off to the side and the main show was these two groups. And, and I remember when they, they broke apart and started forming that and kind of started feuding there. And it, it, I, you know, if you really kind of step back, I was sitting here thinking about that and I never really thought about this back then when I was watching, but that wasn't necessarily a great move, was it? It really wasn't because what they did was by not allowing WCW to save the day and then setting up an angle for this group of bad guys to try and come back and, and do it all over again, they essentially told their crowd, your hometown boys don't matter. And with the heels in charge and the heels running roughshod over everybody, there was nothing for anyone to hope for. And the whole point of watching wrestling is a, is a battle between good and evil. And at some point, good has to win the day. Yes. I mean, especially when you're, you're a lot of your fans, and I'm going to, I think you said a key word earlier, kids, the younger crowd. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, WCW would never allowed the good guys to win the day. Uh, they just had a giant faction of bad guys split into two groups that didn't like each other, and they forced their fans to choose which group of bad guys you like best. Right, right. Well, and I think... Another problem that I'm seeing with that is you had too many big names over in that NWO in, in, in that stuff right there. And you'd taken all of it from WCW and tried to make this inner group inside your group, per se, and it Absolutely. ended up almost turning on itself. Well, you know, and that's because it, the NWO was where the money was. Right. Uh, all yeah, the yeah. money was coming in through the NWO. So naturally, most of the wrestlers wanted to be a part of the NWO because then they'd get a piece of the T-shirt sales. They'd get right, right. some of the spotlight. They probably wouldn't have gotten without it. Uh, it just turned into a really big cluster. and A snowball. Uh, a big old it snowball. really did, and that's where you kind of have to wonder, and that's why we, we have the segment, you know, who booked this, because at some point you have to wonder when the powers that be are sitting back watching this implode before their eyes, who greenlights this? Who doesn't step in and say, hold on a second, we're getting away from the whole point here, and that is that at some point the good guys have to save the day. I, so we're going to have to try and at least – pull temporarily pull the plug and allow this to reset so that we can try and uh maybe do this again 
but come at it from a different way so that it looks different and we can continue to make money. I'm going to guess it's it's like bean counters. You have bean counters counting the money. And obviously the NWO was a product that was probably their best money-making product. You mean the t-shirts, all the merchandise. People were probably coming to the events, watching the pay-per-views for the NWO faction of this thing. And I think, obviously, they had created that NWO with putting all the major stars into this thing and, and Hogan over in this thing. To me, after kind of just sitting here dissecting this thing, Hogan probably should have stayed on the on the good side and, and with Sting maybe. And maybe they could have pitted, you know, Sting and, and, and Hogan against the NWO and Hogan's always the savior of the day and could have saved the day and boom, WCW would have won. Well, you know, and, and I think that Putting Hogan in the NWO was definitely the shot that it needed to make it take off. But if Sting would have just beaten Hogan clean at Starcade '97, yeah, and then yeah. Hogan and the NWO, had, if they had gone away for a year and allowed the the new WCW kind of broke led apart by Sting, and then come yeah, back together, yeah, let, let have the new WCW led by Sting go through this post NWO era, uh, and then find a way to put them all back together and you know kind of you know have them rise back up, you know, and, and yeah. then let's try to fight again. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. Um, I will tell you this, when you're talking about bean counters, a good point to be made uh, with this whole NWO storyline, when Ted Turner purchased Jim Crockett Promotions in 1988 and labeled it World Championship Wrestling, from that moment until the year 1997, WCW did not make a single profit any year until 1997 and they profited over 64 million dollars that year wow and then the next year when they didn't do the right thing and allow the good guys to have that win the next year they turned around and lost 84 million <laughs> it all goes down to not playing the cards right and it sounds like they had the cards in their hands they absolutely did they 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 defeated Vince McMahon head to head 84 straight weeks in a row, which was unheard of, yeah, had yeah. never been done. And then they just kind of imploded because they would not change the way that they were doing their business. Meanwhile, Vince McMahon sat dormant for those 84 weeks trying to figure out, how can I beat them at their own game? Right, yeah. And he, he once he started it to win, he never lost. And then, of course, at the end of the day, he purchased the company and he won the war. So did he actually purchase that from Ted Turner? He bought WCW because uh, after the AOL Time Warner merger, uh, Ted Turner was essentially out of power. And that's right. That's right. TBS and TNT made the decision that they were no longer going to air wrestling. So they put WCW up on the auction block, and a company that had beat him for 84 weeks a few years before and grossed $64 million in their best money-making year ever was sold to Vince McMahon, assets, tape library, rings, and contracts for $4.2 million. Holy wow. <laughs> a business that made $70 million, 60, you know, whatever millions it did. You know, and of course, its whole run there yeah. was sold for $4 million. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it just goes to show if you, you know, play, don't play the cards right, don't run the business right. And like you said, I think... I was just sitting here running stuff through my head. I mean, what if the Sting had beaten Hogan and Hogan was like, oh, man, I don't like this. And, you know, he flipped back to, to good guy and, you know, that, you know, WCW would have won then too. But I think you're right. I think for the fact that they never let WCW win over the NWO cleanly or, or really, period, it, it was devastating in the end. It really was. It, it was It was a classic miscalculation. Uh, and, of course, you know, as the segment says, we just look back at it and we say, who booked that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Hopefully it wasn't Ted Turner because he's probably kicking himself. Well, NL, this has been uh, a great time. I've really appreciated uh, getting to talk with you about wrestling. Uh, I appreciate our listeners out there for tuning in. Um, I do want to make sure that everybody, uh, well, let's just kind of run down what's coming up. Uh, not only do we have a evening with violent reaction tonight, but, uh, this weekend, uh, you're going to have your Saturday night request live. Do you have anything that you want to kind of plug that's going on this weekend? Yeah, obviously we got the new show in nothing but vinyl that that show debuted last week, 
had great, great success. The listeners been screaming at me over the vinyl. What that means to you, listeners, is that we play an actual record, actual vinyl record, live here on Heck Yeah Radio. That show is before Saturday Night Request Live at 7 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Eastern. And then, of course, following that's midnight or uh, Saturday Night Request Live. And then for you late folks for Saturday night, I got Midnight Drive. That playlist comes from my mad mind. I kind of just randomly come up with some stuff and put it out there. I play about an hour or so worth of, worth of music. And uh, that starts at 11 p.m. Central and midnight for you folks on the East Coast. Well, I'm, we're looking forward to this weekend, definitely, for all the programming here on Heck Yeah Radio. I do want to go ahead and just plug real quick. Uh, next week, July 7th, uh, our show is going to be a little bit different. We're going to do something uh, that we haven't done before. Uh, if you ever remember back in the day of listening to the radio and listening to Casey Kasem do the America's Top 40, what we're going to do next week is we're going to do a wrestling Top 40, and we're going to do the Top 40 wrestling themes of all time. And this is actually voted on by uh, fans, people inside the business. Uh, we, we've got uh, right now a survey. Uh, probably about 100 people have checked in on this. Uh, we've been running it on the side, and we're going to go over that. Uh, and then on July 14th, our uh, show will have the interview with Shane Garrett of NWA Top of Texas. Oh, that sounds like I've got some stuff lined up. And, uh, you know, this show just keeps getting better and better. And all you folks need to definitely tell everybody you – you know, even if, you know, they don't know if they'd like wrestling, because, you know, when this show was brought up to me and, and Michael and Rick uh, proposed this idea, I was like, well, I don't know who who watches wrestling anymore, because I had been so disconnected out of it. And then listening to these last couple shows, I almost feel up to speed and, and, and back in the game a little bit. So it's been a very great experience for myself. And tonight's been a great experience in, in talking with you, Rick, and I've definitely enjoyed that. And, and I hope that uh, I can get back on here again and uh, maybe join you and Michael and uh also, uh, if you're fine with me sharing this, some exciting news with this show is that we're going to go live with this pretty soon. So we hope to have some caller interaction and everything else down the road with this show. I'm very much looking forward to that. I would love to be able to have callers and, and you know, talk to people about wrestling. That's what I love to do. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, tonight shows that that, that we definitely do. And uh, uh, I, I did want to throw in one quick thing. We have a few extra minutes here before we've got to close out, uh, but uh uh, wrestling is going to be here. The, the mainstream stuff is going to be here, and it's going to be Tuesday, isn't it? It's actually this coming Monday night. Monday, Monday, uh, that's right. It is the SmackDown roster. Uh, it's kind of interesting because they have Monday Night Raw uh, on television, and at the same time they have a show here. Uh, on two, uh, we, we, They have the show here uh, at the same time. So I mean, you've got you've got the WWF essential or WWE, excuse me. Uh, you've essentially got them competing against uh, themselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually thought about going, but I'm going to be out of town. So I thought, well, that'd be a good, good, you know, thing to get get a shot in the arm and get back into it and go watch it because uh, I think one of the first times they came through Amarillo. Uh, I mean, they probably wasn't their first time, but it was in the mid 2000s or early 2000s. Um, I don't think they had been here in a long time, and it was their first time back after years of absence out of Amarillo. And I went to that show, and it was a fun time. It is always a fun time. I mean, I'll tell you this. For those of you who have never been to live wrestling, whether you go to independent wrestling or whether you go to uh, shows like WWE Live, um, it's always so much different than what you see on television. Uh, it's so much more up close and in your face. It's such a, a more personal experience. I really feel like uh, going to live events is what makes fans. Absolutely. I mean, it's with anything, sports, wrestling, anything you do. I know that I've gone to live stuff and, and really, really enjoyed it. And, you know, it almost gets you drawn back into it and, or drawn into it, period. And, you know, I, I think when you see things live, you've got a scope and you can watch what you want. You're not dependent on a TV to watch what you want. Not at all. Not at all. Uh, live is definitely the way to go. Absolutely. So we're hoping to do that with this show. I, I think we're within a few weeks from that. Uh, do like us on Facebook, Heck Yeah Radio. Uh, that's where you can keep up everything going on with the show when we're live with the music, everything that's going on with us. So uh, definitely keep up with that. But uh, I think we're getting close to the end here, aren't we? Yeah, we sure are. So uh, we can go ahead and uh, we'll let the Land of a Thousand Dances play us out. Uh, we'll see you right here next week. And thank you very much for listening to the West Texas Wrestling Radio Show. Yeah, thanks again for having me.